wait for it to come all the way on, and then you can start speaking into the microphone. Well, we are glad that you are here. It looks like um, either A, it's cold outside and people wanted to stay in their warm beds, or B, uh, the series only tied at one game each, so there's no cause for depression yet. So I don't know. Uh, we do have a lot of people up here in the choir loft, so we're going to start our service. Welcome to South Garland Baptist Church. We're glad that you are here. Let's open our service in song. Stand with me and let's sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Child of God, yes. 
You may be seated. Amen. Well, good morning, church family. It is good to see you this morning. How wonderful it is to be in God's house so we can worship him together. I want to begin this little time here by offering a couple of words of thanks here this morning. First, I want to say thank you to everybody who participated yesterday in our fall festival. Um, We had about 50 families that came out with their kids yesterday to enjoy that. Despite the wet and the cold, they came and they uh, got to see that our church loves this community and cares about the members of it. And so thank you to everybody who took part in that, who came early and set up booths, who stayed late and helped clean up, and who were there throughout to, to welcome folks to our church. It was a wonderful, fun time, and so we're thankful for all of that effort that went into it, all the planning and all the, the work yesterday as well. So, so thank you first for that. And then the second word of thanks that I have today is one that will be offering up kind of throughout the day, and that is to our worship leaders here behind me, to, to Jeffrey, who served as our primary worship leader for the last eight years, as well as to Taylor Nash, who's been with us for the better part of two years, helping and leading in worship. Today is their last Sunday doing so here at South Garland Baptist Church. We made that announcement about a month ago, but today is that final Sunday. So I want to make sure that you know um, that this afternoon at five o'clock, we are having a reception to express our gratitude. And so I want to invite you and encourage you to attend that, to offer thanks for all the wonderful worship that we've been led in over these past years, to thank Jeffrey as well as to thank Taylor. That'll be tonight at 5 o'clock. And then, appropriately enough, we will worship together at the table at 6 o'clock. So reception at 5 o'clock, that'll move straight into the table worship service starting at 6, all that down in Wall Hall. For this morning, for this time that we spend together in worship, Let's take a moment now together to stand to our feet and to welcome one another in the name of the Lord. Let's stand, let's welcome each other. All right, everybody, as y'all make your way back to your seats, let me invite the kids to come down uh, for a message from Miss Sarah. Did y'all have those that came to the carnival? Did you have fun yesterday? Yes. Well, we had fun, and I bet you'll still get to have fun. For I'm, I'm going to leave y'all with this. We're not going to talk about this too much, but, you know, we don't really celebrate Halloween. We play dress up because it's a fun fall time, and because then we can relate to other kids that do it and invite them to church. But that doesn't mean that we have to focus on all the ugly, bad stuff that has to do with Halloween, because we love Jesus, okay? So don't forget that, okay? Okay, listen here. I got a little poem story for y'all today. We're gonna talk about it, let's see. The poor, rich man. Once there was a wealthy man who had a very stingy plan. He put his money on a shelf and vowed to keep it for himself. He filled his bulging barns with wheat, and though he had enough to eat, he wouldn't share. He didn't care that others had no bread or meat. At breakfast time, with toast and tea, he liked to sing this melody. I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm filthy rich, I'll never have to dig a ditch or slave away and work all day. I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich. All day, he's just singing that, okay. 
let's see what he's saying. And then when he ate lunch at noon, he hummed a cherry little tune. It's nice to be, ho, ho, he, he, a man that's filthy rich as me. Although he filled up every drawer, it only made him wish for more. I have three cats, but I want four. I have some cows, but I want more. Let's see what he says. And when at last he had no room, this man began to fuss and fume until he thought, aha, why not? I'll build a bigger, better place where I will have a lot of space. But there was something he forgot. Those who get but never give choose a foolish way to live. When that night the rich man died, no one, <coughs> not even one person cried. So nobody was there. Like then he died, no one cared because did he care about anybody else? Here's what I want y'all to think about. What will others think about you when we're gone, or even <laughs> after you meet them. I want you to think about how do you show them that you have Jesus in you? Do you show them kindness? What are others going to think about you after they meet you or after we're gone? We want others to know that we care about them, right? We don't want to be like the stingy rich man and be alone. But we don't want anyone else to be alone either, so we need to do for the Lord. So that's something to think about this week. Think about how others will think about you when we're gone, okay? Can we be like Jesus? Can y'all show me how to pray? Show me how to pray. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this, for this day. Thank you for this weekend. And thank you, for, thank you for the rain, Lord. And thank you for letting our fun still happen, even with the rain. Thank you for these kids. And thank you for this church family. And Lord, help us all to let your light shine through us and for others to see you in us when they think about us, Lord. Thank you for your blessings. Help us to be like Jesus in everything we do and everything we say. Amen. Amen. Joy, when my heart is heavy all my days.
as Pastor Daniel continues his series in Malachi, we pick up in the second chapter, beginning with verse 10 through 16. Have we not all one Father? Did not God create us? Why do we profane the, the covenant of our fathers by breaking faith with one another? Judah has a broken faith, a detestable thing that has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying the daughter of a foreign god. As for the man who does this, whoever he may be, may the Lord cut him off from the tenant, tents of Jacob, even though he brings offerings to the Lord. One thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer pays attention to your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask why? It is because the Lord is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth. It is because you have broken faith with her. Though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant, has the Lord not made them? In flesh and spirit they are here. And why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirits and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. I hate divorce, says the Lord of it, God of Israel. I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as his garments, says the Lord Almighty. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for it. Is a place
Amen. What beautiful worship we've enjoyed today. Truth be told, um, during the singing of that last song, just for a, a moment there, I, I contemplated chucking the sermon notes and saying we were just gonna, just gonna keep singing for the rest of the service. And if, if that didn't feel like a really mean trick to play on Jeffrey on his last day, then I'm, I just might've done it. Um, but instead, I will ask you to turn to the book of Malachi as we continue with this series that we began two months ago, working through this prophetic book, seeing what words it has for us today. The book of Malachi, last book in the Old Testament. Um, I invite you to turn there now, and we'll be covering the second part of the second chapter here this morning, beginning in verse 10. We begin here this morning in Malachi. I want to talk about a popular character in, in both literature as well as film because it's a character from the story the lord of the rings the books first and then of course the movie adaptations that were to follow there's a lot of heroes you can choose from in that particular trilogy your favorite could be aragorn the mysterious ranger who is in fact heir to the throne could be gandalf the wise old wizard could be one of the secondary warrior characters like Faramir or Eowyn, but, but for many, for most, I might even say, the most popular character of that story is the hobbit Samwise Gamgee, the best friend of the main protagonist, Frodo, who goes with his friend to the very fires of Mount Doom to make sure that he fulfills his quest, destroying this ring which threatens to wreck the whole world. Frodo's the protagonist. He's the one that the whole story hinges upon. But Sam is the one that first readers and then viewers grew so attached to. He's not a warrior like Aragorn. He's not as wise, say, as Gandalf. But, but what he is, what makes him so beloved is that he is faithful to his friend. When the rest of the fellowship of the ring splinters apart in many different directions, Sam stays with Frodo. And when on more than one occasion Frodo tells him this is getting too difficult, this task that, I, that has been laid upon me is too hard, you should go back home. You don't have to endure this with me. Time and time again, Sam says, where you go, I go. I will stay with you to the bitter end. Sam is faithful from the beginning to the end. We admire and respect and value those who are faithful like Sam. Those who don't turn tail when the going gets tough. Those who remain by your side when it's hard to do so. We admire and respect and value those who are faithful. And the flip side of that is we don't have a lot of trust for those who are faithless. It's with that in mind that we turn to some characters we met in last week's message. The priests of post-exilic Judah. Now, if you weren't here last week, then that whole sentence requires a little bit of explanation, I think. We need to talk about who we're talking about here. We've seen how in this book of Malachi, we're dealing with God's people after they have been dragged away to Babylon, after that empire had come in and laid waste to the nation of Judah, to the city of Jerusalem. How the temple was destroyed and the people were carried off into exile for some 70 years. But by the time of the prophet Malachi, the people have been given the opportunity to return home. A new empire has come upon the scene, the empire of Persia, and they've allowed the Jews to come back home and to start over again. To rebuild the temple, to reestablish their traditions and customs, to rebuild the nation to some extent. But by the time of Malachi, 
There's a restlessness because it's not going very well. The temple is being restored, but it's a shadow of the one that came before. The laws and the customs are being reestablished, but it's not quite the same that it used to be. And we saw last week part of the reason for that, and that is the priesthood. Those who were called to be the leaders of the Jews' worship, and yet were giving a half-hearted effort. In last week's reading, we saw how they were presenting animals for sacrifice that were lame or that were sick or that in some other way violated the law God had given his people. And this wasn't out of a scarcity, but rather a lack of attention, a lack of intention. That the priests were offering half-hearted worship to God. And the Lord promised that judgment would follow if they continued. And so with our eyes still on those priests, we turn now to a different subject, a slightly more personal subject, a faithlessness in their marriages. You see, from these priests, what we're going to see is a message that impl- applies pardon me, to us even today. That in a culture that so often tells you your first duty is to yourself. God calls us to be faithful to each other. So let's look here at the text and and, and talk about what the issue is here in verses 10 through 16. The, The issue is an epidemic of divorce in the priesthood. Now, why, why is that a problem? Why is it an issue that these priests are getting divorced? Well, it tells us here in verse 16 in a verse that I'm sure raised your eyebrows when it was read. Verse 16, For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. That's one of those verses that can make a whole room tense the moment that it's read. Because the truth is for us today, this issue of divorce is one that affects every single person. You've got a family member who is divorced. You've got a friend who is divorced. You may be divorced yourself. So to hear this message that the Lord hates divorce, we've got to see what is being said here. We've got to understand what message is being conveyed. And so we've got to go back a little bit to what God's design is for marriage. From creation, when God made the first man and the first woman, and we see this first covenant relationship that would come to be known as marriage. And it's this sort of a relationship that is the design. One man and one woman together in holy matrimony. But what we see so quickly in the book of Genesis is how after the fall, after sin enters the world, this holy design, we begin looking for deviations from it. New ways of carrying out relationship. And so you see things like men laying with women who are not their wives. We see men taking multiple wives. We see men taking advantage of the women in their lives. We see all these different deviations from God's design. And so because of our sin and because of the reality that there are marriage relationships which are shrouded in sin, When God gives the law to his people, he makes an allowance for divorce. Giving different examples under which divorce is acceptable in the eyes of God. When one can sue for divorce and dissolve a marriage relationship. When we come to the New Testament, to the time of Jesus, we often think of Jesus as being the one who lets us slack up on those Old Testament laws, but this is not one of those times. 
Jesus, in fact, raises the bar to show the importance of this covenant relationship, saying that the allowances under Christ for divorce are infidelity and neglect. Any pastor worth his or her salt would add as well abuse under this category of neglect, where there can be an allowance for divorce. But what's clear from both the law as well as the teachings of Jesus is that divorce is not God's design. It's not what he intends for us. He has given us that original design from the beginning, a committed marital relationship. And so the prophet can say here, I hate divorce, says the Lord God. And when you hear that phrase, there's a temptation to re react to it one of two ways. To go to one of two extremes. The first extreme is to make this what's sometimes called a clobber verse. To make this a verse that you can use as a weapon against someone who's experienced divorce in their own life as an instrument of judgment against someone else. To say or even to imply that the Lord hates divorce, and so the Lord hates the divorcee as well. It's not what it says. It's not what it means. It's not what we're called to read here. But the second extreme, on the other end, is to simply dismiss this outright. To say, oh, that's, that's one of those Old Testament verses. And we only care about the Old Testament when we choose to care about the Old Testament. To say, well, that was a long time ago in a faraway land, and it doesn't, that's, that's not, it, it doesn't mean what it says it means. Neither of these extremes is quite right. The truth is that marriage, like any covenant, is important to God. And he expects it to be important to us as well. And so let's circle back now to these priests and to their faithlessness in their marriages. We're given an idea of what the specific issue is here in verse 11. It says, Judah has been faithless, and the abomina an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and here's the key part, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. See, what happened here is these priests who are responsible for leading the Lord's people in worship, likely when they were away in Babylon, they took new wives for themselves. Wives who didn't worship the Lord God, but worshiped instead pagan gods. And this is a problem that crops up throughout the Old Testament with some of Israel's leaders. You see it when Ahab marries Jezebel. You see it in the days of Solomon when he takes on many, many wives from foreign nations. What's the, what's the problem here exactly? What's, what's the issue with marrying somebody from outside of your own people? Is it a multiculturalism issue? No. No, the issue is these wives are bringing their pagan gods into the homes of God's people. They're altering the worship of God's people to where instead of worshiping the one true God and Lord, we've got all of these extra gods being brought into the picture. And what the Lord is clear about is that the fault for this doesn't lie with those wives. We're not to think of them as temptresses luring God's people into this. They're worshiping the gods they've always worshiped. They didn't change. The fault lies with God's people for introducing this into their lives. You, you might think of it like this. Um... In the last two weeks, we have turned into a baseball town, um, if we weren't already. 
Everybody's watching the World Series. Everybody wants to know if the Rangers are going to pull it off or not again. We'll see. So imagine for a second if the owner of the Texas Rangers, in preparation for a potential game six or seven back in Arlington, imagine if he was to give out 20,000 tickets to the citizens of Phoenix, Arizona, just as a gift, to say, we want to invite you to our beautiful, relatively brand new ballpark, and we want you to see the World Series for yourself. So I'm going to give you all 20,000 tickets so you can come see for yourself. How do you think that would go over here in DFW? Not great is my expectation. I don't think that that particular gift would be well received by the people here because those Arizona fans are going to come in cheering for Arizona's team. They're not going to come in wearing blue and red and white. They're not going to come in with their Adolis Garcia jersey on. They're going to come, they're going to cheer for the Diamondbacks, and they're going to boo the Rangers. And so their presence would not be welcome. Well, for these priests, these leaders of worship among God's people, they are taking these wives who worship foreign gods, and in doing so, they're showing a faithlessness to the one true God. They're not honoring their covenant commitment. And in doing so, they're sinning against God. For us today, we have our own covenant commitments. We have the commitment of our marriages, much like in these days. We have our commitment to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And just as then, our covenant commitments are important. And when we don't honor them, we don't honor God. When we're faithless to these covenant commitments, we're faithless to our God as well. So these priests have sinned against God on the one hand. But one key thing to note here, I've talked about them taking pagan wives, marrying pagan women. Not only are they doing this, they're divorcing their Jewish wives to do so. These are not unmarried priests taking on pagan wives. These are married priests who are replacing their Jewish wives with pagan ones. In verse 13, it says, You cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping, and with groaning. And why is that? Because verse 14 tells us, you have been faithless to the wife of your youth. You have abandoned her, forsaken her for the sake of these other women. So this issue is not just a religious one, not just about honoring covenant commitments. It's also a personal problem. These priests have sinned against their wives by abandoning them in favor of what they would see as an upgrade. This is a sin against these women that they've married. It's this way when you break any covenant. There's the principle on the one hand, but there's also the person on the other hand. When you break a contract, when you break a promise, when you violate a covenant... The issue is not just the violation of a piece of paper. The issue is not just some principle. You've also sinned against a person. You've victimized a fellow human being. And that is what these priests have done here. So take heed, the Lord says. Take heed to yourselves and do not be faithless. This is one of those issues 
that we find in the prophetic books where for a moment you can wonder, what about this could apply to me today? What about priests across the ocean a couple thousand years ago? What, what does this have to do with me today? There's your answer right there. Take heed to yourselves and do not be faithless. Do not be faithless to the Lord our God who gave his son, sent him to live and to die and to rise again so that we could be saved. Do not be faithless to the Lord who paid it all so that we could be saved. And do not be faithless to one another. Hold tight to one another in faith. We live in a world, in a culture, in a society that tries to convince us time and time again that you can make it on your own. You can go it alone. And that when somebody disappoints you, when somebody frustrates you, when somebody doesn't see things the way that you see things, well, your first duty is to yourself and you may just have to cut that person off. You may need to just sever the bonds all entirely. You may, may need to remove them from your life altogether. Who needs them, we say. For brothers and sisters in Christ, this can't be our story. We need one another. We're not simply a collection of individuals, but a family of faith. And our calling is to be faithful first to the Lord our God and second to one another, to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Take heed, the prophet says, and do not be faithless. Stick with one another, not only in the best of times, but also in the hardest of times. We're a people of the new covenant, which we'll honor with the Lord's Supper here in just a moment. A covenant written not on stone tablets, but given by the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior. We are a people of the new covenant. May we be faithful to that covenant. Faithful to the Lord who's inaugurated it. And faithful to one another. Let's pray together and then we'll take the supper together. Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you that we can gather together as brothers and sisters in faith. Father, I thank you for this bond of faith that holds us together. And I pray that we would be faithful to it. Lord, that in a world that tells us it's easy to abandon or forsake. A world that tells us that perhaps fellowship is underrated. That my personal walk of faith is all that I need. And I don't need the fellowship of other believers. I pray, Lord, that we would not give in to the temptation to be faithless that we would remember our Lord and Savior who called 12 disciples to be with him throughout his ministry. That we would remember that what he established was not a collection of individual disciples, but a church bound together by faith and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So Lord, may we be faithful to you and may we be faithful to one another it's in jesus name that i pray all these things amen
here in just a moment. The music will begin to play, and as it does, I invite any who is a professing believer in Jesus Christ to come forward to this table to receive the elements, a piece of bread, a cup of juice, and return to your seats. Once we've all done so, I'll lead us in the taking of the supper together. The music will play, come and receive your elements, return to your seat, and then we'll take the supper together. Let's stand together. Let's come to the table. Lord's Supper. We, we do this for three reasons, I think. We do it as an act, first, of obedience. The Lord told us to. And so we do it to honor the command that he's given us to do this in remembrance of him. And that's the second reason we do this, as an act of remembrance. This is a memorial meal that we take together. So that we, as people living today, will never forget what was done for us 
so long ago that God sent his son to die on a cross so that we could know eternal life with God. And so by taking bread and drinking from a cup, we remember the body and the blood that was given so that we could be saved. It's an act of obedience. It's an act of remembrance. And scripture tells us lastly that it's an act of proclamation. That by eating this symbolic meal together, eating this bread, drinking from this cup, that we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. That we show the world even as we remind ourselves what and who we're all about. And so I invite you to take your bread here in your hand and to remember that night when Jesus, in an upper room with his disciples, said to them, even as he says to us today, that this bread is my body given for you. So do this in remembrance of me. When Jesus died upon the cross, he was ushering in a new way of being. A new way to know relationship with God. One based not upon law, but grace. One not written on tablets, but given in blood. And so Jesus, on that same evening, said to those disciples, and reminds us today that this, this cup, this is the new covenant in my blood. So do this in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you for sending your son. We thank you for all that Jesus did in his life, the miracles he performed, the teachings that he handed down. But we thank you most of all for his death. That sacrificial, atoning death on the cross that is our only hope of salvation, that is our only hope of eternal life with you. We thank you for that incomprehensible love that you showed us in sending your son to die in our place. And I pray, Lord, that by taking this supper together as an act of obedience and remembrance and proclamation, I pray that we would be reminded of the price that was paid for us and that we would seek to live in that new covenant as believers in Christ and witnesses to the good news. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. The hymn that we're about to sing is part of what we proclaim by taking the supper together. My Jesus, I love thee. And so let me invite you to stand and let's sing those words together.
It is our last Sunday of the month, and so in just a moment, we'll move into a brief time of church conference to take care of a little little bit of business. But as we close out worship together, I want to do so with a prayer of benediction today, and then uh, all of our members will be seated and move into church conference. So let's close our worship in a time of prayer. Father, we thank you today. Lord, we acknowledge our frailties. We acknowledge our weaknesses before you. We acknowledge and we confess our sins to you, but we come to you trusting, indeed knowing, that our sins have been paid for on the cross by our Lord and Savior. We thank you for that precious sacrifice, and I pray, Lord, that what we acknowledged once, whether it was long ago or far more recently, that acknowledgement that my Jesus, I love thee. I pray, Lord, that that would be true today. I pray that by the way that we live, when we leave this place, that we would show our love for you, that we would be people of that new covenant and that we would be faithful to you and to one another. So be with us as we go. In Jesus' name that I pray, amen. You may be seated.